Psalm 61. So we're going to catch up really quick, go through and just do a quick overview of what we've seen so far. Um, so Psalm 61. David starts out, the first point we had was uh, our first resort. David says, hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. So we know that the first place we should be turning to when we have problems is we should be turning to prayer. We should turn to our God. And David is showing when he says, hear my cry, O God, attend to my, attend to my prayer. We see in this verse how desperate and how passionate he is. And the application statement we had, we can better prepare for the trials to come by actively following him today. We need to have that happening. Then second thing, the, the reason for seeking God. Verse two, from the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. And so we know David was forced to leave Jerusalem. So when he says to the ends of the earth will I cry, that in his mind was a distinct possibility. I could be getting forced to go somewhere I have never seen before and be banished from somewhere that's you know, where he wants to be, where his delight is. And I, the word picture that stood out to me so much in there is that when my heart is overwhelmed, remember, it's like the wave that's coming and about to drown you. It's just darkness. It's hopelessness. And David is saying, when that happens to me, I'm going to cry to my God. It doesn't matter how bad things get. I'm going to cry to my God. And that word he uses for cry out is the word that means to accost. Literally, I'm going to just throw it all. I'm going to cast everything at my God. I'm going to give it all to him. Application statement there, when the hard times come, and they will, we must actively pursue God with our concerns. Then last week, uh, we looked at point three, second half of that verse, uh, the rescue desired, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. So David is saying, God, help me find you. He's admitting his weakness. He knows that he can't get to where he needs to be. He can't find that safety, that comfort on his own. He needs God to direct him. Application statement there, nothing good dwells in us, in our flesh. So let's call on the Lord and rest in his goodness. And point four, confidence based on remembrance. Verse number three, for thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. So David is saying, I want you to lead me because you've done it before and you can do it again. I have confidence you in you because I've already seen you accomplish great things. So the, the, the big thing we looked at was our actions today prepare us and affect our problems we're going to run into later on. Application statement on that one, our daily faithfulness in small trials grows our endurance so we'll be more inclined to follow Jesus when the harder trials come. And that brings us to our new text we're going to be looking at tonight, verse number four. <clears throat> Excuse me. The result, the result of past remembrance. Somehow I should be able to get this show what I want it to show. There we go. The right thing up here. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Pete. Okay. Result of past remembrance. So let's go ahead and pray, and we'll look at this new text. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for loving us. Lord, help us to be faithful to you. Help us to have a passion for you. Help us to remember you as our trials come and to stand for you, to stand with you. I pray that you would use this time to be encouraging to us, to be challenging. Father, I pray most of all that you would use it in some way to glorify yourself. Lord, help us to love you and to rest in you. 
In Jesus' name, amen. All right, verse number four. Verse number four. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings, Selah. I will abide. And if you notice, as we look through this psalm, look up in verse number two. From the end of the earth will I cry. Same thing, I will. Verse number four, I will abide. I will trust. You keep seeing these I wills through this chapter. What David is saying is this, I am committed. I'm committed. So verse three, what we looked at, because of what God... I'll, for thou hast been a shelter for me, a strong tower, because of what God has been in the past, because of his faithfulness in the past. Now in verse four, I will. Because of what I've seen in the past, I am committed now to doing this. How many times have you met someone, or maybe it's been you? you we, we like to look back into the past, and, we, and I'm going to call these, we like to look at trophies. We like to look at trophies of our spiritual lives, trophies of our success. Maybe you've heard somebody say something like, you know, back in 40 years ago when I used to do this, I remember going to the store and leading someone to Christ 40 years ago. I remember back in the day, I used to get involved and do X, Y, or Z. I used to do these things back in the day. And we had these trophies that are sitting up on a shelf, if you will, collecting dust. And we're pointing back to things that have happened in the past, remembering what God has done then. I want to submit to you this. It's good to remember. It's good to remember what God has done in the past, but God's working is never meant to just be a trophy sitting on a shelf it's meant more to be armor that we put on to go get in the fight so that we can continue on in the battle it's meant to remind us of his goodness so that you and i can serve him better today not just remember yesteryear the things i used to do that is a temptation that is hard at times to get out of that mindset and to get back into the fray his past deliverances his past looking here at david's case his past answers to prayer his past help david used this as an as an impetus as a as an encouragement to keep serving god to be faithful now that's what those past things are for they should encourage us today to keep being faithful. So David here in this verse, he lists two different things. And he says, this is what I will do. This is what I am committed to doing. Now, the, the wording here can go two ways. The wording can be, I will do this, a statement, a declaration. It can also, as we look at it, it can, um, it can be read, Lord, help me to do this. Let me do this. Either way, David is saying the same thing. He said, I am passionate about making this happen. Either I will do it or Lord, let me do it. David's got a passion that he is expressing in this verse. So David is saying, I am totally committed. We could stop. Seriously, we could stop here. If you and I can just get this idea down that I need to be passionate I need to be serious-minded about following Jesus. You know as well as I do, as we look around this country, that's not America. That's not our churches today. There are people today who can say, yeah, I'm passionate about following Jesus. I want to follow him. But as a whole, we're, that, we're a very lazy culture. It's very self-centered. And the passion in our country normally is for self. And for comfort, as opposed to it's all about Jesus. If we can get this commitment level down, this passion for Jesus, here's what I encourage you to do. 
a simple prayer. God, please renew my passion. Give me a passion for you. That's a good prayer to pray often. Because if you're like me, it's like, okay, I can be passionate minute one, but in five minutes later, I'm thinking about me again. And we need to constantly keep asking God to give us, like David, to give me this I will attitude. So let's look at what he did, what he said. I will, first one, abide in thy tabernacle. I am going to abide in thy tabernacle. We've talked about the tabernacle a little bit. Who can remember what that tabernacle, why was the tabernacle in David's time period so important? What's the big deal? God with his people. Yes. 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 Okay, I, I'm going to reword both of you. It's, it, that's the perfect answer. The idea being that was God's, the visible representation of God here. That's what they had. And if you think about how neat that would have been to have seen that Shekinah glory in that place, that would have been awesome to see. And they, I don't know how much, you know, how, that was the way, the place where God dwelt. Now, is that the same today? Is this where God dwells? In here, yeah. It's not this building. It's not, okay, I got to stay close to this tabernacle building. It's this tabernacle. God comes, and now he dwells within us. But David, at that point in time, he said, I want to abide in thy tabernacle. Now, let's just think of that word again, abide for a minute. What are some words, phrases, that we could use that will help us understand what it means to abide? What's a word, phrase, that would be synonymous with that? Okay, to be within. What else? Okay, depend on it. Okay. Okay, home, base your life in it. That was the first word I had. Yeah, dwell in it. Live with. That, the idea, and several of you mentioned that, that, that constancy of fellowship. It never ends. It's that idea of constantly giving God, when we're going to abide with him, constantly giving him worship. Constantly giving God Praise. You may, it, this is a, in a sense, we might think of it as a negative term, but it's like, God, I want to be your slave. I want to be there and be for you and be your, to do your bidding, whatever it is you want. I want to be totally devoted to my God. And it's not so much he's saying, okay, I want to go live inside that tent. His idea that he's giving is it's a statement of worship. I want to be this abide in thy tabernacle, I want to worship God. I want to be fully his. Now, do we have this today? Not a loaded question as far as the tabernacle part. I want to be fully devoted to God, fully devoted to him. Has anything changed with this from then until now? Does God still desire our praise and our worship and our devotion? Is God desirous, this, this is a little bit loaded, is, is, is God just desirous for people to say, oh, I'm a follower of Jesus, and that's it? I'm going to say no. That's cheap. Anyone can say these words. He's, he, he desires worship. He desires devotion. That's what he's looking at. And David is saying, this is my commitment. So today, we use word, this, this is a key word that we would use. And somebody had said this verse this morning. It may have been in Sunday school, I'm not sure. Uh, but whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I think that was in Sunday school this morning. There, I've heard people who have expressed the meaning of this as just being, just say Jesus is Lord and you're saved. Is that what that verse is talking about? No. 
What is the concept when he, when, when and, and this is an important, an important truth for us to understand. When that verse says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's obviously a true statement. So we've got to understand what it means. And it's important for the context of what we're looking at. When we read the name of the Lord, what is it talking about? Yes. It's who he is, his attributes. It's everything about him. It's understanding who he is. And then it's, it, here, I'm going to reword that verse just a little. I think it will help us understand it. Whosoever shall call on Jesus, who he is, as Lord. He is the one. It is all about him. Whosoever shall acknowledge him as Lord of our lives. We can use some different phrases, and we use them often. Call him Lord. Submit to him. Follow him. Yield. Do all to the glory of God. All of these things are all kind of saying the same thing. Us follow him. Us respond to him as Lord of our lives. This is the idea that we're getting to in our culture, in, in, in our context, I should say, for this abide in thy tabernacle. Rep recognize and follow Jesus as Lord. When we talk about call on him as Lord, it's not so much as we, we look back at a past event. Was there a time when I recognized Jesus as Lord of my life at an initial setting where I entered a relationship with him. Yes, there was. There was a time when I recognized who he was. I recognized where I was and I needed to make a reconciliation. I had to make peace with him based on him being God. That had to have happened at a point, but we are to abide in that presence. This is what David wants to do. We're to abide in that presence of Jesus as Lord for all of our lives. We should be recognizing him for his, for his deity, recognizing that he is the one that we are to answer to. He's the one who sets the marching orders, and we're, we're to respond to this. That's what David is saying. I want to abide in thy tabernacle. And let me just add this, this, this phrase to help continually. I want to constantly abide in your tabernacle. And I, I almost left out this word. I want to abide in thy tabernacle. What's those next two words? Forever. Forever. I can remember talking to a few people. This has been some years back. I remember one saying a phrase something like this talking about a specific issue that he was going through. And he said, I tried that and it didn't work. And so he quit. He quit doing the, the issue that we were discussing. I tried it God's way. It didn't work. So I stopped. David <clears throat> isn't putting any qualifiers in here. I am committed to abiding in the tabernacle of God. I am committed to acknowledging, in our context, Jesus as Lord of my life, as the one who calls every shot. I'm committed to it forever. Total commitment regardless. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 9. We please him, whether death, whether life, anything in between, we, please, we strive to please him regardless. That is what David is saying here. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. Okay, before we move on to that second one, questions, comments? I would agree. 
I would agree. And it's, uh, are there times when we do things God's way and we still get trials and difficulties? Yeah. So the key to that is you keep doing it God's way, regardless. Yes, we must. And that's what David say. That's a good phrase. I will. I'm going to keep on keeping on. I'm not going to quit forever. Jane. Yes. We are. He wasn't Levi. No. The key with David is the same thing that needs to be true with us. He was committed. He was committed. And that's where we need to be. There needs to be that commitment. So let's look at the second one. I, again, this I will, I am committed to trust in the covert of thy wings. Now, we talk about wings. I'm not going to go off on this too far, but it's a good example. It's a good illustration. When we think about wings, what is often a, 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 um, a picture, an illustration that is given for wings? Yeah, the chicken. Okay. And it's a good example. It is a good example. We, and how many of us have heard when... The example of the farm burning down and the farmer coming through, seeing everything wiped out, this charred chicken, and he gets he just kicks it. And out come all these little baby chicks. The mama hen protected, she covered, and 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 this it is a good example. And, and the scriptures use that examples, but I want to suggest to you that uh this is a little different. Notice the wording here. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. Now let's bring that picture back to the, this verse. His tabernacle. What wings do we see in the tabernacle? Yeah. Where are those at? And what is that called? The what? The mercy seat. It's the mercy seat. God just has his, I'm, I'm using the words here, but follow me if, we, if you would, his wings, oh, his wings of mercy covering. He's got his mercy seat. And I want to suggest, given the fact that it's in the context of this tabernacle and trusting in the covert of God's wings, he is putting his trust in the mercy of God. He is looking at David. It's like David is saying, my confidence my security, every anything that I can accomplish for good, any good that comes of my life, it is all because of the mercy of God. I am dependent on God. So it's like David is saying here, I'm going to trust God totally in your mercy. I'm depending on you. I'm depending on you alone. I'm going to trust. I am going to rest in my God. That's a good place for us to be. Trusting in what it's nothing of us. We just got an awesome God. And I don't, I honestly still, I don't, I cannot put my mind around a perfectly holy God for whatever reason saying, hey, you come to me. I'll receive you. I don't get that. I know he didn't get a good end of the deal. And it is, it's it's just his mercy. And that's what we depend on. He's just an awesome God. Now, we're going we're gonna to hit one more word in this verse. Before we move on from this, any comments on this mercy of God, resting in him, depending on him? Yeah, what's that last word? Yeah. What does it mean? I know it's a musical term, and people debate this one. You've heard me say what it meant for what I think it means. So we'll go from there. Think on this. Yeah. Stop for a minute, slow down, and think about what we just said. That's what he's saying. Okay, so here's what we're going to slow down, and I want us to pull away what are some key takeaways 
that we can pull away from these verses so far. Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth while I cry unto thee, when my heart is overwhelmed, smothered, drowned out with darkness, lead me to the rock that's higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower, so you've shown yourself faithful in the past. Because of this, I will abide in your tabernacle. I'm going to trust in the covert of your wings. What are some key takeaways from these verses so far? I don't want to skip by that sila and not sila. Yes. That's good. What else? Yes. Good, good. What else? Oh, I'm sorry, your hand going up or is moving? Okay. And often when we don't. And, and what's the key to that? The key, when we start seeing... God doing this lifting up, God doing this rescuing. And again, maybe you, you don't do this. I often, want, I take things for granted. It's more of, oh, that worked out. Oh, that was okay now. Oh, this, okay, fine. I'm out of my trouble now. Instead of looking and saying, look what my God did. And, and, and here's my word, intentionally remembering what God did. Do you guys ever struggle? I mean, there, there are times when I can get, I get to be sometimes very negative and I will dwell on things that are just bad and that are just, you know, I'm, I get so, and it's not that I'm trying to think evil things. It's like all these pressures are there. I mean, just looking around at our country and looking around at the world and everything's negative and, and I can dwell on this stuff and I can, I can get distant and when I get that way, I don't remember what God has done. I struggle with this. I need to intentionally think on what God has done. Going back to your intentional thing about what God's done, you say maybe brought that tired of me. Yes. I actually made a say with the rock that he was turning to, that rock out there in the desert where it's the water Yes, yes. Remind ourselves, this isn't it. There's bigger and better coming. That's good. Yes. Um, you know, David's in the middle of trouble, and so he might not be able to flesh out his practical explanation at that time or why God is trustworthy. It's just like it's what 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 Jesus said was that to become a child, right? And you know, I, I I remember I remember as a child being scared, going to my dad, right? I mean, there was not necessarily a rational explanation, okay, he'll be able to fight off the wild dog, he'll probably be able to overcome this, but it was just dad. You know, it was it was a very simple faith of just go to dad and then stick with dad through the scary parts, right? And now as a dad being experienced a bit of that, it's I, I like it. I like it to come to me. In some cases, I'm like, I'm not sure. You know, 
<laughs> yeah. There's, you know, there's, there's a, there's a lot of uh, simplicity that uh, all that's required in these cases to go to God. Mm -hmm. They are my own hope. Right. I'm glad that God is much bigger and better dad than we are. Like I remember once I was, uh, we were out walking and this dog came out. It was a fairly, I forgot what kind of that one was. It was a boxer, but it, it just had a nasty bark and it was charging us. And I'm thinking, and I'm not even thinking, I'm dad, I got to take over. I can go do this. I'm going to go stop this dog. And, and, and I'm trying to go stop this dog. And I've noticed I can't move. And I don't know what's going on. And then I realized one of my kids had me and they weren't letting go. <laughs> and, I'm like, and I had to pull away from them because it was, you know, they, they wanted dad and they were, they were holding on to me, not realizing what they're doing, but I'm thankful we got a God who's not, he's not held back. And he does want us holding on to him. He can handle it. I couldn't handle it very well. I had to pull free, but yeah, that exam is a perfect example. We're to be trusting him. So another image that keeps popping in my head without this falling in my head forever. I think about the Pibica, the, the son, the lame son of Saul, right? And David shows kindness to him. Yes. And what does he let him do? He lets him dwell at his table for the rest of his days, right? He's eating in the king's house, right? He's not a member of the family, but he is welcomed at the table. And you know, it's like it's what David wants. It's like, Lord, let me let me dwell in your let me be a welcome guest at your table in your house. Just in the end. That's good. That is good. There's a lot of pictures of Ms. Bibishef when you think about it. He was the son of the enemy, but yet he was the son of friend. He was the son of God. Yeah, they going under Saul, Jonathan. Yeah. He had the heritage of the enemy. That's what I meant by son of. I'm sorry. But the son of, grandson of, son of, but also of Jonathan. Just, you know, we can come in and have that fellowship because of Jesus. That's what got us the right. That's, that's what got Mephibosheth. The right was Jonathan. It wasn't because of him. That was good. A good example. Anyone else? There, there's a lot packed into these four verses, which is why I'm concentrating on the seal up for a little bit. I like that David, he did look back. He remembered what God had done. And for him to do that, there had to be times when he was calling on God. He was realizing, I have a need. I'm calling on God. And God gave him grace and mercy to respond and to follow him. And David took it. And those times strengthen us as we respond, as I respond to God in a biblical way, it strengthens my patience, my endurance for the next trial that's coming. I'm preparing for tomorrow's trials today. I'm getting ready or I'm not getting ready today for what's coming down the road tomorrow. And we need to be doing that. We need to walk with God now and exercise our salvation. Work out our salvation. That was an encouraging challenge for me. Yes. I think so. Um, worrying about it, uh, you know, fret not yourself for tomorrow. I shouldn't be having to worry. I, I should. I am commanded not to be worrying about tomorrow. So when I say prepare yourself for tomorrow, what I mean by that is by responding to Jesus today. When the Holy Spirit says, Rick, no. And I respond and say, you're right. I, I follow you. By responding to him in the situations today and obeying him, 
that sets me on the make your next decision a right one. It gets you on that path. I'm going to say yes to God. I'm going to say yes to God on this. And it's a matter of submitting. Am I willing to follow him? That's how, what I mean when I say prepare. It's more prepare, not for individual things that might happen. I need to prepare to obey him regardless. And when hard times come today, and I say, yes, God, and it may have negative, humanly speaking, consequences, and I still say, yes, God, that prepares me for when a harder one comes tomorrow. It's so easy. I mean, just as an example, it is so easy to justify sin because it's going to make things more comfortable for me. Well, if I can hate sin like Jesus hates sin, regardless of the consequences, I don't need to worry about those. I need to obey God and follow him. If I'm willing to do that today on an easy issue, and I'm making that up, on an easy issue, when the harder one comes tomorrow, I'm more inclined to obey him on a harder issue. So I apologize for not being clear with that. I, I did not mean uh, prepare for whatever trial might come specifically. I meant prepare our hearts to submit to Jesus in his ways, period. Does that make sense? Okay. Anyone else? These have been excellent. So we need this. We're going to wrap up this section. We need to meditate on the commitment that we've signed up for. When we called on Jesus for salvation, this is why I know I get a little maybe OCD or extreme, maybe extreme on this. I've heard so many people say, if you want to be saved, just say, Jesus saved me, and you're okay. Just pray this prayer, and you're okay. When we get saved, when we receive Christ as Savior, a transaction is happening where we are saying, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want to submit to you. I want to follow you. It's all yours. I'm yours. That's what salvation is. And too often, we want to make it easier. It's kind of like, remember when I said this morning, that somebody had encouraged me one time, don't say discipleship is a lifelong encounter because people will be scared off. Well, it is a lifelong encounter, so we need to call it what it is. Salvation is you totally surrendering to God, not just getting heaven one day. It's him ruling our lives. It's him being Lord. And that's not an optional command. Salvation is him becoming Lord. We're to follow Jesus, period. And for us as people who would say, I'm a follower of Jesus, that's a lifestyle. It's not just case by case. It is a lifestyle in every area of our lives. We follow him, and that's what David is exhibiting in these verses. So our application statement, as we dwell on our Lord, our commitment to him, will grow. As we dwell on our Lord, our commitment to him will grow. Okay. Well, we are going to stop here for today. Let's close in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you again for your goodness. Thank you, God, that you are working. I thank you that there is nothing that's coming or to the ends of the earth that's going to take you by surprise that you cannot handle and that you, Lord, that you will leave us in. Thank you for being there and for being faithful. Help us to trust in your mercy, to put our confidence in you and you alone. Lord, I pray as we go through the rest of this week, Lord, as our next decisions come up, that we need to choose right from wrong. Help us to respond wisely. Help us to have a passion like David, to call on you and to abide with you and to, to have you as Lord and director and ruler of our lives. Use us this week in some way to further your kingdom and to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen.